So we are, we're in the season called Advent, and I know, just, you know, I wanted to kind of quickly uh, clarify here, like, I know a lot of us in this room come from different church backgrounds, and so, you know, when we talk about Advent, some of you are like, I grew up with Advent. We did that all the time at my church growing up, and some of you are like, add what? Like, what are we adding? What's, what's, what's going on here? Uh, And then there's everyone else who's probably somewhere in between, but Advent uh, it's, it's just, the word Advent simply means arrival, and it's the season where we look back and, at what uh, God did by sending Jesus, the rescuer, by sending him that, that first time, and it's also a time uh, that reminds us to look forward, to look ahead at the, at the return of Christ, that he will one day come back, and so it, it's a, a season filled with anticipation, uh, it's anticipation. And, you know, looking back and looking forward at, to, you know, at Christ when he came originally and when he will come one day return, those are, that's a rhythm that Christians, you know, we, we should always be doing that. You know, we should always be looking back at, 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 uh, and remembering Christ, his birth and his death, his resurrection, and also looking ahead and knowing he's coming back. But what I love is specifically about this season, the season of Advent, is that it turns up the dial. It turns up the dial, and it gives, it's a, a season of increased anticipation. And I love it. I love this, this time. And this past week, I was reflecting on Advent and all, all the anticipation that's built into the season as we, as we make our way towards Christmas. And I was reminded of just how, how much you and I are wired for hopeful anticipation. You know, you and I, we were created with this innate ability to look forward to things, to, to anticipate. We love to have things to look forward to, don't we? You know, it's, whether it's the next weekend, you know, everyone's, oh, I can't wait to the next weekend, looking forward to it, regardless of what you're doing, looking forward to the next weekend, or how about that next vacation? We love to look forward to that time of, of rest and where we can get away. Uh, some of us are looking forward to a new Star Wars movie that comes out on Thursday, but who's keeping track? I don't know. You know, some of us are looking forward to the time that we're going to spend in a couple weeks with family as we, as we gather together for Christmas. And some of us are looking forward to that same family leaving and going back home after Christmas. But the thing is, we love to look forward to things. It's, it's a part of who we are. We love to have things to look forward to. But what I was reminded of this past week was that all of the little things that we look forward to, they're all shadows of the real thing. In other words, all of these secondary anticipations, whether it's the next vacation, the next, you know, whatever it might be, all of those secondary anticipations, those were never actually meant to be an end in themselves. They're, the secondary anticipations are meant to encourage and to expand our anticipating capacities for something greater. You know, the, enjoy, the enjoyment the little things provide us and the anticipation that we experience as we wait for them to come, all of that is, is meant to point us to the main thing, to point us to the greater primary anticipation, the one our hearts truly ultimately long for, and it's Christ. I was... Uh, thinking on this, and I came across this one quote. This author says that momentary expectations will never fulfill our deepest anticipations. These are shadow-like anticipations, and Christ is the substance. All of these other anticipations are like a stream, but Christ is the ocean. All of these other anticipations are like a beam, but Christ is the sun. So Advent this whole season is it's meant to point us back. It's all of these, these smaller anticipations and things that we look forward to throughout the season. Are, they're meant to help us trace our way back to the greater ultimate fulfillment of all those desires and anticipations. And so that's what I love about this season. I love the heightened awareness, like the heightened anticipation that we get. We get. And so uh, we're going to be jumping in here, but let me just pray as we do that. Father God, I am so thankful to be here with friends and family, with this church, with this body. God, I pray that this morning, Lord, that you would you would come and and do what only you can do. Lord, that you would help to take the words that I speak, Lord, and that you would translate those in the ways that we 
each of us need to hear. All of us here are, are experiencing different, different things. There's, there's highs and lows, and, and there's all different kinds of things going on in our lives. And God, you know exactly what we need to hear. And I pray that you would just deliver a custom-tailored message of good news to our hearts this morning. As we look at a familiar story, Lord, may we see past the, the noise, the clutter, the familiarity, and, and see you for who you are and be relieved as we experience that good news once again. Praise in your name. Amen. Well, we are in week two of our Advent series. It's called Here Now. If you forget the name of the series, I just want you to look up here. Here Now. We ordered the biggest letters that we could find to help remind everyone. Uh, but last week, uh, Ryan kicked it off, and he really he showed us how the arrival of Jesus, the arrival of the Messiah, was not, was not a surprise. It wasn't like, oh, what's going on? But Jesus wasn't a surprise to, the, to his people, to Mary and to Joseph. Uh, the coming of the Messiah was something that had been predicted, going all the way back to to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, it, it, and Ryan covered this last week, it talks about the fall of mankind and that Jesus, or that God in that moment, he promises that one day he will send a rescuer. He will send a, 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 a rescuer who will fix everything that we, were, that we broke. He says in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And that's really the first like whisper of Jesus. The first whisper that one day God will send a savior. But all throughout the Old Testament, the prophets provided breadcrumbs, hints, and clues that all pointed to the coming of the rescuer. And, and the thing, I, the reason this is important is uh, it's so easy for us to see the Bible as just, it's a bunch of disconnected stories. It's a series of disconnected stories, but that's not what the Bible is. I know that it can sometimes seem that way. It can sometimes seem like these are all disjointed and random stories that how do they even connect with each other? But all of the stories in the Bible, all of the, the stories are pointing and telling one big story. And that story is God's rescue mission to save and redeem broken people. And it may sound like an oversimplification at first, but taking as a whole, that's the story that the Bible tells. It's the story of a divine rescue mission. And the hero of the story is not you and me. It's not even the heroes of the, of the Bible, the, 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 the characters, you know, the heroes of the faith that we point to at times. The hero of the story is Jesus. He's God's rescuer. And so if you want to just kind of like a, an, a really simple overview, like what is the, the story the Bible tells? It's the story of God's rescue mission, and it's broken into two parts, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament points to and predicts Jesus, and the New Testament presents him. It's all one story. And so as we heard just a few moments ago in the reading, we actually see the rescuer show up. The one that the prophets had predicted is now being presented. And what's crazy is that we see the rescuer shows up. He shows up as a baby, as a child. A child in weakness and in vulnerability. And I know it's really easy for some of us to, we've, we're probably really familiar with the story. We've heard it. And uh, there's a certain danger that comes with familiarity. You know, the, the, the curse of familiarity, the, the danger of familiarity is that, you know, what once wowed us, what once blew us away can just become bland and like, eh, okay, cool, I've heard that before. And it can easily become dismissed. You know, one of the challenges that pastors and teachers face is, is the challenge of each year retelling the same story to people who have heard it 10,000 times. It's a challenge. But I'm glad that this is a story that never gets old. But specifically, the question that I want to look at this morning is this question. And it, it, it's not going to be very, well, maybe it'll be a profound question. I think there's some, it's profound in some way. But the question is, why did Jesus come as a baby? It's a fairly simple question. But have you ever thought about that? I mean, why not just come as a 30-year-old man? 
why not just show up and take care of everything over the weekend? I mean, I was, th- I was actually thinking about it, like, okay, what if I was, I was God, like, I was Jesus' personal assistant in heaven, and I was preparing him for this trip. I, I bet I could put together a pretty uh, efficient itinerary for him. It'd, it'd probably be something like this. I'd say, okay, I'm going to have you roll into town on a Friday. Um, come on in. You can do a couple miracles here and there, the water to wine thing. Ah, that's cool, but do a couple miracles. It's up to you. It's up to you. Uh, we'll go ahead and have you killed on the cross Friday afternoon. Don't be late. Uh, we'll spend some time in the grave, resurrect on Easter, and boom, back in heaven on Monday. Well, that's not the way that it went down, obviously. But the question I want to ask is, why not? Why come as a baby? Why spend roughly 30 years in obscurity living a relatively normal life. And there's so many things that we could talk about when we talk about the significance of of Jesus coming as a baby. But today I want to look at just two significant reasons that Jesus showed up, not as a fully grown 30-ish year old man, but as a baby. And I do believe that, that to the degree that these truths sink in, that we will be set free. And the first reason I want to look at that why Jesus came as a baby, as man, was Jesus came to be our substitute. Now, when you and I think of a substitute, we usually think of the, the lesser version of the real thing, right? You know, I, don't, I, I want to apologize if any of you are substitute teachers here, but I'm just going off my own experience here. But when I heard that we had a substitute teacher coming, I was like, dude, yes. We're just probably going to watch a movie. We're going to play the thumbs up, seven up game. I don't know. Do you guys remember that? That was fun. Or I, I might not even need to show up for class because, I mean, they're not going to know. Or I'll pretend to be my friend and do something dumb. And yeah. So that's one way we look at it. Another way that we look, think of substitutes are the, they're the backups on the sports team. You know, the subs. And the subs are the ones that come into the game when, when the starters just need a break. Or something happens to the starters. So they're the the lesser version of the real thing. But when the Bible describes Jesus as our substitute, it has a completely, a radically different meaning. Rather than being a lesser version of the real thing, Jesus comes as the true and better version to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. The Bible tells us that Jesus comes as our substitute, not to help us, like, finish the last 10%. Like, you're doing great. You're almost there. Oh, I got it. I'll help you out. He doesn't come just to help us finish that last 10% or to come in like he's the closer. No, he comes in as our substitute to completely redo everything that we've done. To completely redo it. I recently watched a documentary on the Foo Fighters. Great band. If you like them. Anyone? Anyone? Takers? Yeah. Uh, so and if you know anything about the Foo Fighters, you know their front man is Dave Grohl. He, you know, sings and plays, plays guitar. But before he did that, he was the drummer for a band called Nirvana. And Dave Grohl, is, he's a phenomenal drummer. But Nirvana ends, and he, he begins uh, the band, the Foo Fighters. And so he's a phenomenal drummer, but he's, now he's playing guitar and he's singing. Imagine having to be the drummer in Dave Grohl's band. A guy who could blow you out of the water in drumming skills. Okay, there's some, some intimidation there, likely. What the documentary showed, <laughs> this is so screwed up. Uh, what the documentary shows, was there's this time where the band, they're working hard, and they go to the studio, and they get all of the tracks laid, all, everything's done. They're like, sweet, the album is finished. And everyone's like, all right, see you later. They all take off, and Dave Grohl sticks around in the studio, working a little overtime. Stays, he stays uh, in the after hours. And he ends up, when everyone leaves, he ends up re-recording all of the drums on his own. Do you believe that? I mean, he's Dave Grohl. He, he can do that. But that, that right there, I mean, the, the, and then they showed the drama that happened when the drummer, the other drummer found out that, uh, he's like, this is not what I played. But he's like, this is good. But if he found out about it. And, of course, he was hurt uh, and offended, and he ended up leaving the band. Uh, but in the same way, our best efforts are failing. 
And Jesus didn't come as a substitute to say, oh, almost there. You almost got it. I'll take the last little bit. No, Jesus came as our substitute to completely redo the tracks. He came to completely redo everything because we weren't cutting it. And the fact that Jesus comes as our substitute can feel, to be honest, it can feel pretty offensive. It's like, why do I need a substitute? To admit that, uh, that we need a substitute, I mean, that requires us to accept the fact that we need help. And so it's important for us to remember that, remember our context in this whole thing and our, our condition. And before we get, we explore how Jesus is our substitute, we need to first look and understand why we would need a substitute in the first place. Again, I've, really, are things that bad? It seems like a little bit of an overreaction for Jesus to come and redo everything. But in order for a substitute to be good news to us, because that's what it is, but in order for it to be good news, we need to first realize our need for good news. We need to realize our need for a substitute. The first thing we need to do is admit that there's a problem. There's a, there's a problem. And part of the problem can be seen just by, just by observing our world. Just by looking out and observing the world, we can recognize and understand, like, we live in a broken world. I hope I'm not bursting in anyone's bubble. I don't think I am. But we live in a broken world. We have, we have a world filled with death, with disease, with divorce, with disasters, the terrible Ds. <laughs> we have, our world is broken. And all of those things, all of the death and disasters, all of those things, they, they, they remind us that this world is not how it should be. I think deep down inside of us, we realize, like, this is wrong. This is not how it was meant to be. There's a problem. And the brokenness that we see just out, outside in the world around us, it reminds us that this is a broken world, that the world is under a curse. And it's tempting to think at this point that if we just solve, if we just fix all of those things out here, that the problem will be solved. And so we're going to put, you know, all of our attention and our time into trying to fix all of these things outside and then the problem will be solved. But we realize, if we're honest, that the problem goes deeper than that. The problem is far more pervasive than we realize. You see, we're not only, we not only live in a broken world, but you and I are broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. So the problem isn't just outside of us, no, the problem's out there, out there. No, the problem is inside of us. And if we're honest with ourselves, none of us are the people that we are supposed to be. We all fall short. And the Bible tells us that the reason we are, are broken people and the reason that the world is, is broken is because of our sin. It's because of our rebellion. It's because of our crimes against the sovereign, the sovereign king. At some level, we are all failing to live up to his standards, his laws. And remember, the standard that we fall short of is not, the standard isn't us compared to others. That's how we think of it sometimes. I heard someone once say that we might believe Romans 3.23 all fall short of the glory of God, but that doesn't stop us from comparing distances. It's like, oh. I thought I was bad, but that right there, wow, I'm, I'm doing okay. Now, the, the standard is not us compared to others. The standard is us compared to the holiness, the glory, the perfection of God. And when we compare ourselves to him and to that, we, we're all in the same camp. We're all guilty in God's courtroom. We've all sinned. And the thing is, our sins, our crimes against the sovereign have accrued a huge debt. So one of the, the big reasons why we need a substitute is because we owe an enormous debt. And the problem, the problem that we have is that we do not possess the resources to pay off that debt. We don't have the resources to do that. We are, we are in a predicament. So that's why why we would need a substitute is that we're broken people living in a broken world. We do not have the, we don't possess the resources to fix it, and we are guilty. But this brings us to how 
Jesus is our substitute. You know, a, a central feature of the gospel is the forgiveness of sins. You know, it's the forgiveness that we receive. Jesus on the cross, he pays the price. He stands in our place as our substitute, and he dies the death that we should have died. And that is amazing. That's incredible. That is such liberating news to know that there's forgiveness, there's pardon. But that's only one side of the gospel coin. Let me put it this way. Imagine... Imagine one of those days that you've got a lot of yard work to do, and there's a wedding to go to afterwards, okay? It's just one of those days. Yard work and then a wedding. Okay, so you're, you're doing your yard work. You're outside in the blazing heat. You're in the dirt. Dirt's going everywhere. It's in your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your arms, all the crevices. You're just sweaty. You're getting, it's all nasty, but you're getting the yard work, yard work done. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wow, it's time to get ready to go to the wedding. Two things need to happen at this point. First thing is that you need to take a shower with soap. Uh, and then you need to put on new clothes. Because you imagine if you were just, if you were to just change your clothes and not take the shower, come on, ew. Think about how gross, how, how sticky and how smelly you are. You still have all that dirt all over you. And you're just like putting on the wedding clothes, like oh, I'm going to the wedding, dressing up, but you're still gross. You need to take a shower. But imagine like uh, you took a shower, you're all clean, you're fresh, and then you put your yard work clothes back on and to go to the wedding. Like that's not good either. That's no way to go to a wedding. You see, both things need to happen. You need to be clean. You need to take that shower and you also need to put on the new, the fresh, clean clothes. In the same way, forgiveness and pardon, is that's only one part, one side of the gospel coin. And it's an amazing thing, but there's that, that cleansing that happens. But there's another side too, and it's this other side that actually helps us make sense more of why Jesus came as a baby. And let, me, let me illustrate it this way, and I've, I've used this before, but imagine, imagine you're buried with just an insurmountable and impossible amount of debt. Okay, there's, you have no means, you have no job or income, there's no means to pay it off, even make a dent. You're, you're a million miles away from having your debt paid off, and you're light years away from being rich. Now imagine someone comes, comes around, and they, they hear your sad story, and then they decide, hey, I'm going to take care of all of your debt, and they do. They pay it all off. Let me ask this, and that'd be amazing. That'd be incredible. Wow, like all of that debt gone. Let me ask this question. At that point, are you rich? No. You're absolutely not. You're still broke. You've got zero in the count, and you have no job. You have no w ways of, of income. You're still broke. Now imagine that same person deposits into your account just billions of dollars. So now, now you're rich because of what they've given you, what they've deposited in. I know it's not the perfect analogy, but it does illustrate something wonderful about what Jesus did for us as our substitute. And he died the death that we should have died. He stood in our place. He was our substitute on the cross. He took the wrath of God upon himself, the, uh, the punishment that we deserved. But Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't just leave us broke and left to fend for ourselves. We were also given something. We were given something incredible. Something amazing was deposited into our account. And there are many places in Scripture that, de that describe this, this divine transaction that took place. But one of my favorite places, one of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 5.21. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, this is the time of year where we, uh, we've got all kinds of white elephant gift exchanges, right? You guys into those things? Yeah? Probably going to OD on uh, white elephant gift exchanges this year. But those, those are fun, though. But there's always that one gift that everyone wants, right? 
And I don't like that freeze rule. I like, dude, oh, you keep it open, and it, there's no three steals, and it gets frozen. It's like open season until uh, whatever time's up. Um, but there's always that one gift that everybody wants. It's usually like the gift card to Starbucks. At least the white elephant one, things I go to. Then there's always that gift that nobody wants. It's like you, you open, it's like this ornate, ornate package. It look, looks all nice. You open it up, and someone's old oven mitt. You're like, are you kidding me right now? Who wants to trade? Uh, well, this verse is this, what it's describing is the ultimate gift exchange. And in this exchange, Jesus willingly took the worst. He took our sin, but he didn't stop there. He gave us the best. He gave us his righteousness. He gave us his perfect record. Jesus was our substitute in that he died the death that we should have died. He stood in our place. He took the blame, but he was also our substitute in that he lived the life that we should have lived. He did both. Jesus spent 30 years living a perfect life, earning and accruing a, a perfect record of righteousness. And what's so cool is that everything he did, if you read the Gospels, you just look at the life of Jesus, everything that he did from the moment he was born to the moment he ascended back up into heaven, he did on our behalf. He was our replacement. He represented us. He obeyed God perfectly. He never sinned. And the Apostle Paul here in this, in this scripture reference is telling us that Jesus' record of perfect obedience is gifted to us. The righteousness of God is put into our account. So, so Jesus not only stood in our place as our substitute to take our punishment, to pay our debt, and to suffer the curse for our disobedience, he also stands in our place as our substitute, someone who perfectly kept God's law and earned the blessings for perfect obedience on our behalf. Jesus was born as a baby to be our substitute obeyer. I don't even know if that's a word. But that's why he, he came as a baby to be our substitute obeyer. The question here is, okay, that's great. But why does this matter? Why are we even making, this, making a big deal about this? Well, many, many Christians, and this is a really a big part of my story, is that we carry around a truncated gospel. Sure, we have no problem b believing that, uh, you know, the gospel theologically, like, yeah, I believe, you know, Jesus on the cross, he was my substitute, he paid the price for my sin, hallelujah, amen. But functionally, we live as though our standing with God is now riding on our shoulders. It's all riding and contingent on our performance. We say, thank you, Jesus, for paying, my, paying the debt. Thank you so much, you got me in. And now it's up to me to keep myself in. Now it's up to me to earn God's favor. Now it's up to me to make my life matter. This is everywhere. This is, and this is what I, I grew up believing that God's view of me, and it wasn't something that was explicitly taught. It was something maybe that was implicitly caught, or it was just assumed, or it wasn't stated. But I just grew up with the belief that I knew, okay, Jesus loves me, but I, it was up to me to keep God happy with me. I didn't know if God liked me because I was aware of all the, the, the ways I struggled and, and could not get it right. I'm still struggling with the things that I struggled with like years ago. Why can't I beat this? Why can't I get past it? I want to grow. And there's a sense of like, I'm just, God's not happy with me. God's rolling his eyes at me. But when we believe that it's, it's up to us to keep ourselves in, it's up to us to earn God's favor. That's just a recipe for a life of burden and burnout. The truth of the gospel is that our standing with God ultimately has nothing to do with us. It's entirely riding on Jesus. Our standing with God has nothing to do with us. It's riding on Jesus because it's Jesus' righteousness that God sees. And the glorious freedom and relief the gospel brings is that we no longer have to wonder how God feels about us. We no longer have to wonder, is God happy with me? 
The truth is that God is infinitely pleased with us because of the righteousness of his son, Jesus. So we don't have to worry about how God feels about us. Again, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it's an amazing thing that there's nothing that we can do to make God love us any more than he already does. And at the same time, there's nothing that you and I could do to make God love us any less than he, do, than he does. The thing is, when we forget that truth, we begin to believe that God's love and his acceptance is all writing and it's based on our performance. I want to read something I came across a few years ago that kind of illustrates just how ridiculous it is for us to think that we can earn our way to God and earn his favor. Let me read this. A man died and was standing at the gates of heaven, waiting to be admitted. To the man's utter shock, Peter said, you have had to earn a thousand points to be admitted to heaven. So what have you done to earn your points? Well, I've never heard uh, that before, but I think I'll do all right. I was raised in a Christian home and have always been a part of the church. I have Sunday school attendance pins that go down to the floor. I went to a Christian college and a graduate school and have probably led hundreds of people to Christ. I'm now an elder in my church and quite, I'm quite supportive of all of what the people of God do. I have three children, two boys and a girl. My oldest boy is a pastor and the younger is a staff person working uh, with a ministry to the poor. My daughter and her husband are missionaries. And I have always tithed, and I'm now giving well over 30% of my income to God's work. I'm a bank executive and work with the poor in our city trying to get low-income mortgages. How am I doing so far? He asked Peter. That's one point. <laughs> Peter said. What else have you done? In frustration, the man exclaimed, Good Lord, have mercy. That's it, Peter said. Welcome home. You know, by living a perfect life, Jesus earned all the points that we need. It is finished. He earned all the points that we need. And as our substitute, all of those points are given and attributed to us. They're credited to us. A guy named Jerry Bridges said this, and it, it, totally, it just absolutely resonated with me. or struck me. It's powerful. It says, you are as righteous today as you will be in heaven. In other words, if you are in Christ, you are as righteous today as you will be in heaven. I mean, allow that to sink in. Because I guarantee most of us don't feel that way. But if you're in Christ, you're as, you're as righteous today as you will be in heaven because your righteousness has nothing to do with you in the first place. All of the righteousness that you need it was given to you, and it was, it was put in your account by Jesus. And so Christian growth, and, and, and what, what we mean by Christian growth, like sanctification is, is the word that we use. And, and Christian growth, what that really means is, or what that really is, is the process of depending less and less on my own righteousness, my own performance, and instead depending more and more on the righteousness of Jesus and his performance. It's looking away from what I'm doing, all of my checklists, all of the things that I feel like I'm contributing. Our, my, my hope, our hope is never meant to be in the things that we are doing, our, our points that we're trying to get, but in the points that have already been won by Christ. So that's one of the reasons Jesus co uh, came as a baby was to be that substitute to live that perfect life. And another reason I want to look at briefly is that Jesus, he came to, as a baby to be our solace. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
You know, it can be incredibly lonely for us when we're going through a season of hurt, when we're experiencing pain. It can be incredibly isolating for us when we, we're being misunderstood or when we're being marginalized by others. And I know that there's plenty of us in this room right now who pro- might feel alone in what we're going through and what we're facing. But how wonderful is it, though, when you meet someone who knows exactly what you're going through? How free is it when you meet someone who gets it, who they've been there, they understand, they understand what you're going through? Well, Christmas, Christmas reminds us that God gets it. In the person of Christ, God says to us, I understand, I get it. And because Jesus came as a baby, he grew up in a broken world. He grew up with broken people. He understands what we're going through. He knows what it's like to lose the people that you love. He knows what it's like, what it feels like to be rejected, to be resented, to be misunderstood by other people. And Christmas is the reminder that God understands us. And he understands us and still he doesn't roll his eyes at us telling us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and get busy, come on. No, he comes down. He comes down into the mess. And because he did, he can now sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows what it's like. You see, the God of Christianity is unique in this sense. The God of Christianity isn't far off and aloof. He is near. And he is here now. And because God drew near at Christmas, because he was born as a baby, was our, he lived a perfect life as our substitute. He died as our substitute and rose again. Because he drew near, we can draw near to him. You know, we've been given the righteousness of Jesus. It's ours. And the righteousness of Jesus gives us that all access passed into God's presence. And so we can draw near in confidence to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace and to help in our time of need. It's an amazing thing.